Oh. I just saw something. Oh, what? American fiction writer Lauren Miracle once said, You will love the ocean. It makes you feel small, but not in a bad way. Small because you realize you're part of something bigger. The ocean makes up more than 70% of the Earth's surface, with more than 90% of all living creatures calling it home. No doubt, the ocean is connected to our lives in many ways than we are aware of. Recently, scientists have come to even realize that a key part of the ocean could be the key to ending one of humanity's biggest hurdles, unending hunger. However, one conundrum lingers in the minds of these scientists. For thousands of years, this part of the ocean has been left untouched from the prying hands of humans. What would happen if this undisturbed habitat is suddenly used to sustain humanity's insatiable, ever-expanding population? Can we finally end world hunger once and for all, or is it back to the drawing board? Hello, and welcome back. Today, we react to the conundrum surrounding a fish that could save or destroy the world. In 2018, NASA began training numerous astronauts and engineers, as well as testing a new underwater probe. But why? What exactly is a well-known space agency looking for in the ocean? According to NASA scientists, there seems to be a lot more to the ocean than meets the eye. I mean, despite the fact that our ocean spans more than 70% of the Earth's surface, it is almost a proven fact that we know nearly nothing about it, in comparison to how we understand the Moon and the Red Planet. A prime example of our lack of knowledge is concerning one of the most abundant sea creatures in the ocean, the lanternfish. Huge numbers of these fish were first noticed during the Second World War, when naval sonar operators received echoes from what appeared to be a moving seabed. There is sound, and I could move my cursor over top of it, and if I listen closely... One that mysteriously rose to the surface at night and fell back down at daybreak. However, there is a certain air of controversy that revolves around this bottom dweller. Many marine scientists have estimated that the portion of the water where these fish species inhabit holds a huge source of omega-3 fatty acids and fish meal that can feed the world's population. And now plans have been set in motion to understand how to make these regions profitable. The EU has even funded a five-year research project to investigate such opportunities and back in 2017, Norway issued 46 fishing licenses for the Twilight Zone. These and other initiatives have been developed to encourage twilight fishery. Now, coming back to the lanternfish, the huge numbers of these fish species have made them a subject of hot debate, as several organizations intend to fish these creatures for the purpose of quote unquote, feeding the world. Now, even though these guys are most likely not going to be on your menu, as they are far too bony, their high oil content means they could be mashed down for animal feed, mostly for fish farms. But the idea of thousands of shining fishes moving freely within the twilight zone doesn't seem to please the big fisheries and pharmaceuticals that intend to utilize them, as leaving them untouched would be, in their words, a complete waste. Now, that could be true, but like Gerald Brom points out, everything comes at a price, and some things could cost more than others. This begs the question, how much are we prepared to pay for this new taste, and how virtuous is the goal of quote-unquote feeding the world? In 2019, the United Nations Special Envoy for the Ocean, Peter Thompson, made a key observation. In his words, Basically, there are five things happening in the ocean. The first three relate to climate change. That's ocean warming, think death of coral, think rising sea levels, death of certain nations. Uh, then think uh, deoxygenation, less oxygen, fish will come down in size. And the third one, of course, is acidification. But there are two other things that are affecting the ocean at the moment. And that is pollution, and the second one is fisheries, harmful fishing practices, including fisheries subsidies. For decades, 
Scientists have been sounding the alarm about this looming catastrophe involving our ocean. Yet, too little has been done by global leaders to stop the impending disaster. In reality, the reverse is actually being done. And as Professor in Biological Oceanography Michael St. John hints, as coastal stocks are exhausted, interest in alternate marine resources in the twilight zone will increase. And as there have already been various attempts to exploit the mesopelagic community, this could lead to an unregulated gold rush, as soon as the technology is available and the cost is justified. Some fish species, like the Patagonian toothfish, which is now recognized as Chilean sea bass, takes at least 8 to 10 years to mature. But since they cannot reproduce until then, and given they are one of the most popular requests in many restaurants, they are very vulnerable to overfishing. Luckily, the lanternfish is more capable of withstanding sustainable hunting pressure that may soon befall it, since they are much faster growing. Regardless, the issue still stands. The part of the water where they reside is an unregulated space where there are no rules for fishing. For instance, Peter Thompson made a particular point that stands out in the case of the lanternfish, and that is the effect letting industries loose on these fish may have on the climate. The lanternfish may appear to be scary in looks, but as the famous saying goes, never judge a book by its cover, or in this case, never judge a fish by its looks. These creatures play a super important role in regulating the climate. The lanternfish, specifically, practices a daily ritual of swimming up and down, forming a vital connection between the surface of the ocean and the deep. During their daily migration to the upper layers, they feed on planktons, but release carbon at depth. The result is an additional mechanism for fast transport of carbon from the atmosphere to the ocean's interior, dampening the CO2 contribution to global warming. To catch enough lanternfish and make it worth the effort, the big boys would most likely use huge midwater trawl nets and target them during the day as they cluster together in large shoals that are pretty easy to pick up with sonar. The nets would not damage the age-old corals, yes, but as they sieve and strain the open waters, they'd end up catching other untargeted animals, like the dolphins or turtles that are already in deep trouble. Well, there is really no simple solution that can be universally employed to ensure that all fishing is done sustainably, at least for now. Marine ecosystems are to be preserved, but so are human livelihoods due to the ever-expanding population. There are just too many conflicting interests involved. Too many countries that cannot afford to properly monitor and enforce good fishing practices, and way too many people who depend on fishing for their livelihoods. But, as Mahatma Gandhi famously remarked, an eye for an eye will only make the world go blind, or in this case, persistent conflicting interests will inevitably change nothing to make this situation better. That said, it's not too late to save the ocean. Minimizing the impact of overfishing on the environment involves a lot more than just watching this video and doing nothing in the end. We all have a part to play in defeating this silent disease disturbing our planet. History has shown to us time and time again that when the big boys enter new regions, particularly when they are in search of new species, there are always devastating environmental effects. Can this same mistake be avoided this time in the twilight zone? Well, what do you think? Tell us in the comments section. For the time being, it's back to the drawing board in terms of exploiting these fish to alleviate world hunger. In any case, if you enjoyed the video, drop a like and share with a friend. As always, thanks for watching, Fact Nomeno. We'll see you next time.